Professor Yoon's The Evolution Theory from the Viewpoint of Christianity, the Thorough Analysis of the Descent or Origin of Man, Lecture 2, Chapter 1, The Evidence of the Descent of Man from Some Lower Form. We will first see how far the bodily structure of man shows traces, more or less plain, of his descent from some lower form. And the mental powers of man in comparison with those of the lower animals will be considered in the succeeding chapters. It is notorious that man is constructed on the same general type or model as other animals. All the bones in his skeleton can be compared with corresponding bones in a monkey, bat, or seal. It is so with his muscles, nerves, blood vessels, and internal viscera. The brain, the most important of all the organs, follows the same law. Man is liable to receive from the lower animals and to communicate to them certain disease as hydrophobia, variola, the glanders, syphilis, cholera, herpes, and etc. And this fact proves the close similarity of their tissues and blood. Monkeys are liable to many of the same non-contagious disease as we are. Monkeys suffer also from apoplexy, inflammation of the bowels, and cataract in the eye. Medicines produce the same effect on them as on us. Many kinds of monkeys have a strong taste for tea, coffee, and spirituous liquors. These trifling factors prove how similar the nerves of taste must be in monkeys and men and how similarly their whole nervous system is affected. Man is infested with internal parasites, sometimes causing fatal effects and is plagued by external parasites, all of which belong to the same genera or families as those infesting other mammals, and in the case of scabies to the same species. Man is subject, like other mammals, birds, and even insects, to that mysterious law which causes certain normal processes, such as gestation as well as the maturation and duration of various diseases to follow lunar period. The whole process of that most important function, the reproduction of the species, is strikingly the same in all mammals from the first act of courtship by the male to the birth and nurturing of the young. Monkeys are born in almost as helpless conditions as our own infantes, and in certain genera the young differ fully as much in appearance from the adults as do our children from their full-grown parents, so that the correspondence in general structure, in minute structure of the tissues, in chemical composition and in constitution between man and the higher animals, especially the anthropomorphous ape, is extremely close. Man is developed from an ovule about the 125th 
over an inch in diameter, which differs in no respect from the ovules of other animals. The embryo itself at a very early period can hardly be distinguished from that of other members of the vertebrate kingdom. It is quite in the later stage of development that the young human being presents marked differences from the young ape. Not one of the higher animals can be named which does not bear some part in a rudimentary condition, and man forms no exception to the rule. The former are either absolutely useless, such as the mammy of, of male quadrupeds, or the incisor teeth of ruminants, which never cut through the gums, or they are of such slight service to their present possessors that we can hardly suppose that they were developed under the conditions which now exist. So rudimentary organs must be distinguished from those that are nascent. Nascent organs, on the other hand, though not fully developed, are of high service to their possessors and are capable of further development. But as rudimentary organs are useless, or nearly useless, they consequently are no longer subjected to natural selection. Man differs conspicuously from all the other primates in being almost naked, but a few straggling hairs are found over the greater part of the body in the human and fine down on that of a woman. The different races differ much in hairiness, and in the individuals of the same race, the hairs are highly variable, not only in abundance, but likewise in position. Comparing those of man with the uniform hairy coat of the lower animals, there can be little doubt that the hairs thus scattered over the body of man are the rudimentus. It appears as if the posterior molar or wisdom teeth are tending to become rudimentary in the more civilized races of men. These teeth are rather smaller than the other molars, as is likewise the case with the corresponding teeth in the chimpanzee or orang, and they have only two separate fangs. They do not cut through the gums still about 17 years. In Malayan races, on the other hand, the wisdom teeth are usually furnished with three separate fangs and are generally sound. Professor Schaffhausen accounts for this difference between the races by the posterior dental portion of the jaw being always shortened in those that are civilized, and this shortening may, I presume, be attributed to civilized men habitually feeding on soft cooked food and thus using their jaws less. The reproductive system offers various rudimentary structures. There are vestiges of parts which are efficient in the one sex, but rudimentary in the other. Nevertheless, the occurrence of such rudimentus is as difficult to explain. On the belief of the separate creation of each species, 
rudimentary mammae exist in the males of all mammals, including men. These, in several instances, have become well developed and have yielded a copious supply of milk. Their essential identity in the two sexes is likewise shown by their occasional sympathetic enlargement in both during an attack of the missiles. The bearing of the three great classes of factors now given is unmistakable. The homological construction of the whole frame in the members of the same class is intelligible if we admit their descent from a common progenitor together with their subsequent adaptation to diversified conditions. On any other view, the similarity of patterns within the hand of a man or a monkey, the foot of a horse, the flipper of a seal, the wing of a bat, etc., is utterly inexplicable. It is no scientific explanation to assert that they have all been formed on the same ideal plane. It is reasonable to suppose that a former progenitor possessed the parts in question in a perfect state and that on the changed habits of life they become greatly reduced. And this reduction is explainable either from simple disuse or through the natural selection of those individuals which were least encumbered with the superfluous part. Thus we can understand how it has come to pass that man and all other vertebrate animals have been constructed on the same general model why they pass through the same early stages of development and why they retain their rudiments in common. Consequently, we ought frankly to admit their community of descent. This conclusion is greatly strengthened if we look to the members of the whole animal series and consider the evidence derived from their affinities or classification, their geographical distribution and geological succession. It is only our natural prejudice and that arrogance which made our forefathers declare that they were descended from demigods, which leads us to deeper to this conclusion. But the time will be for long come when it will be thought wonderful that naturalists who were well acquainted with the comparative structure and development of man and other mammals should have believed that each was the work of a separate act of creation continued on the following lecture. Shalom.